The National Mall in Washington, D.C. is filled today for a Promise Keepers rally. Now, live coverage of the all-male movement. It begins with what's called a Native American welcome, which is coming up in just a couple of minutes. The schedule includes about 40 speakers and ends with an address by Promise Keepers founder Bill McCartney. July 1991, we had 4,200 men show up in the basketball arena in Boulder, Colorado. We worked hard for six months in 1991 to bring together 4,200 guys. And what happened that day, you just had to be there. None of us had ever experienced anything like that. It was as if the Spirit of God came down on that place. What we didn't anticipate was the incredible presence that God met us with during that time. We challenged the men that if they would each bring 12, next year we could fill the football stadium. We could turn 4,200 into 50,000. By that, the explosion of Promise Keepers that you know, before we were standing the gap, we'd had over 50 full stadiums. And it just made sense. It made sense that, that we would all collectively in the United States be moving towards something together. I'm telling you, it was dynamic. And everybody there was like, it was like a supercharged environment, unlike anything we'd ever tapped into before. Promise Keepers itself was a miracle. Get up all over the stadium and come quickly. I want to give my life to God. I want to receive Jesus. As I looked around, I felt like the Lord said to me, what do you see? And I said, Lord, I see guys that are sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, well, what else do you see? And I said, well, they're almost all white. And I felt like the Lord said to me, you can fill a stadium with 50,000 white guys, but I'm not coming. But if you have a full broad section of the body of Christ, I will be there and I will bless it. Randy Phillips had the vision for DC. He had been in DC years before. I came to DC to participate in the National Day of Prayer. I began to pray, and an experience I've never had to this, to this day. Maybe it was a vision, right? So my eye just catches this huge valley and these hills. And then my attention gets snapped away to where I see um, a multitude of men just fills that whole valley. I remember saying, guys, you're not gonna believe this. I think God wants us to bring a multitude of men to DC. We showed up early that morning on the mall and realized men had camped out throughout the night. And many had showed up early in the morning before the sun rose. And as we looked toward the monument, the Washington Monument in the distance, and we saw all these men, tears just started rolling down my cheeks. Look at all those men. I said, I feel like God and Jesus are looking down and they're saying, look at the men, look at our family. Being there at the event was just powerful. Here's a sea of humanity as far as you could see. And, and I was towards the back, so we were actually able to sit down, but it was shoulder to shoulder. What you're gonna see in the mall this Saturday is you're gonna see an incredible demonstration of the Spirit of God because it's gonna have a full representation of God's men. Across all denominations, across all colors, we're coming there to celebrate the fact that we love God, we believe Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and we believe as men, we have dropped the ball. We have abdicated our roles and it, we are going before God and we're asking him to forgive us. That's the reason that we're coming. October 4th, 2022 marks the 25th anniversary of this historic Washington, D.C. gathering of men. And although 25 years has brought huge changes for our country and the world, the core tenets and heart of Promise Keepers remain the same. Focused on honoring God, integrity, racial reconciliation, and serving others, Promise Keepers continues to provide space for men to share their struggles, experience God, and come together in unity, despite denominational and racial differences. 
How do you explain the condition of our society? Why is it the way it is? You look at any society, as goes the church of that society, so goes the society. The 90s, goodness. That decade was filled with the rise of multiculturalism, of course, hip hop in our community and community of color, but also spread into every other culture around the world. Independent and alternative media um, came into prominence. Collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States becomes the number one superpower. Also the rise of a new and influential liberalism that struck our country. Spiritually, it was the decade of countercultural Christianity. The evangelical and charismatic and Pentecostal uh, communities entered the mainstream in many, many different ways, especially in media. There was the rise of identity politics, uh, globalization of Christian broadcasting, um, global racial reconciliation was happening in countries around the world, and we had heads of state who were repenting of past sins in order to bring healing and forgiveness. There was the Million Man March that sought to focus on black male identity, and that was in the midst of the focus, a strong focus on family and, and, and marriage. Other men's ministries that had been emerging in the 1980s and really reached a, a point of culmination, such as uh, Promise Keepers, Christian Men's Network, and other men's movements. So the 90s was a, an interesting time. And as we look at it, we can understand how it set the stage for where we are today. Come on, man, shout! I remember walking up these back stairs and walking up on the stage and looking out to a sea of men. Early on, PK, I just choked, right? I remember the first time I stood in front of a stadium. I don't know what I said, but it wasn't very good. But I stand in the gap. It was such a clear sense of why we were there. And for me, my part to try to help frame what it is we were to do. Why are we here? Why has a multitude of men from almost every city in the United States and leaders from more than 60 countries come to our nation's capital? Is it to demonstrate political might? No. Is it to display masculine strength? No. Is it to take back the nation by imposing our religious values on others? No. Is it to celebrate the fact that we as Christian men have been uncompromising models of integrity and purity? Tragically, no. We have not come to demonstrate our power to influence men. We have come to display our spiritual poverty that Almighty God might influence us. Though we now stand in the political center of arguably the most influential nation on earth, it is not political preferences we are concerned with, but biblical convictions. When it comes to politics and faith, we confess that we have had too high a view of the ability of man and too low a trust in the sovereignty of God. We choose this day to bow our lives in submission before the one true God existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that the ultimate answer to the moral crisis of society is not in partisan agendas, but living truth. We have nothing to offer any special interest group, but the same mercy and grace that is available to all in the Bible, God's written revelation of faith 
and practice. I have a request for those of you who love Jesus Christ but may have come here to voice your opinions on specific political issues. We have dedicated this as a sacred assembly. Would you suspend today your appeals before men? And would you unite with us in appealing in prayer before a righteous and just God? Is he not able to move in our land above and beyond what we could ask or think? We have not come to exalt our gender as males. We have come to exalt the man, Jesus Christ, who is Savior, who is Lord, and who is God. Stand in the Gap was a gathering of hundreds of thousands of men uh, from across the country and around the world on the Mall in Washington, D.C. We gathered to worship, to, to pray, and to unite around the common theme of reconciliation. Reconciliation to God, to family, and to responsible manhood as well as reconciliation to one another uh, as men, as part of the human family. I think um, the vision of coming together as one in D.C., it, it, was, a, it was a message and a time for men to respond to, to such a time as this, that kind of a call. Everyone goes to Washington, D.C. to gather, to say to the political powers, um, we are for this, listen to our voice. We were zero, no intent to speak, speak to the political powers. We were there to focus on God's heart and God's authority, which was much greater than any of that. D.C. is the epicenter of, on the human level, just political power, and, and th this human power, and why not come together there on that ground where our founding fathers kind of laid it all out um, and humble ourselves before the Lord. So it made sense to do it there. As you look at biblical history or our own lives, the, the natural trajectory of the human heart is to drift and to, and to live life independent to not honor God, to not look to Him to guide. And so we, we naturally, that's our natural drift every day. And if, if gone over a long period of time, as collectively the cost that that can bring is, can be devastating. In ancient Israel, when they would very much be aware of that drift and they would see an impending threat that was about to destroy them, uh, a wise and desperate leader would call what would be called a sacred assembly. And a sacred assembly would be to gather together to recognize that we are only hope now. We can no longer fix this ourselves. We've been doing a pretty bad job at it for a long time. We can no longer fix ourselves and that we are crying out for God's mercy and grace. And so we picked October 4th simply because it fit a window of our schedule and weather and all, and then the national parks had fit their windows, so we picked that day. It wasn't for several months later that we picked the day between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the days of awe. And that Sabbath, that Saturday, is the highest of holy days that the rabbi would prepare for his congregation to deal deeply around repentance and reconciliation. So that's, that's the Jewish calendar, right? So it's like, what? Today there are hundreds, perhaps even thousands, 
of Messianic Jews in this very crowd join together with our Gentile brethren because the Messiah has made peace between Jew and Gentile. Um, well, my favorite story from Santa the Gap is that you had 1.4 million men at the mall, the biggest gathering in the history of Washington, D.C. There is a picture of that when you walk into the, the park police headquarters of that event, of the perfect event. Because when those men left there, they cleaned up after themselves. And there was not a gum wrapper left on the ground when they left. And if that is not an example of what happens when the men of God come together and act like men of God. They got together, they supported each other, they praised God, and they left the place better than they found it. There were two police officers who were special escorts for Coach McCartney. I was with him at that time. They told us that they were on, on in their patrol car doing Stand in the Gap. They said that from 12 o'clock to 3, they got zero calls. And they called in and said, is our radio working? Is everything okay? We've got no calls. They said, we don't have any reason to call you. What happened, they told us, there was not one call that they got from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock, which was the time we did stand in the gap. During the time we had a holy convocation, God put a hush over Washington, D.C. Being on the stage with the speakers and just being in awe of what we were looking at. And, um, you know, we weren't on the ground. We weren't on blankets. We were on, we were more comfortable, more comfortable, but just, it was, um, you know, just watching them and you know, praying over them. And then I, these were the best Christian speakers in the country, right? I, I mean, it was six hours of just unbelievable worship and teaching. And, and there was such an amazing love and affirmation that he took the worship and made it just something deep and powerful that hit guys deep, deep down the heart in ways that we not many of us not experienced before. Being on that stage, being in awe and just saying, God, this is just a glimpse of what's to come. And I'm ready for that. I'd like to invite you to think for just a minute about your religious heritage. Max Lucado during the event, this was a memory I'll never forget. He asked all the men on his count of three to yell at the top of their voices. And on the count of three, I want all of us to say the name of our religious heritage, denomination, or name of church. Imagine 1.4 million men blasting out noise. It was just the, the loudest noise, chaotic noise you've ever heard. Now on the count of three, I would like for you to shout with me the name of the Savior who has redeemed your soul, Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and that to me just kind of brought it all together. It was like, this is it. This is, this is the potential when Jesus prayed for us in John 17, that we would be one as he and the Father are one. That was a, you, you couldn't have a better visual illustration of that. Stand in the gap is, is in my opinion, a replication of what happened in the Old Testament when God's people came together to confess their sins. Probably a historic day in many ways. The mission is, is um, taking some of us guys out to D.C. to for stand in the gap. I've never had this type of opportunity to do anything of this magnitude before. That that is called a family meeting, and I've got to show up. My main goal 
goal is to go there and be broken before the Lord and to pray and intercede for this country. Just come before Him with repentance in our hearts. We are going to seek God's face. To get on our knees and pray and seek God. Struggling to be a better father, to be a better husband, to be more loving, to be more caring, patient, gentle, kind, all those things. I don't find the strength in myself to do that. We are such messed up people and I just praise God that He might let us all see him a little more clearly. Our generation of men, my generation, okay, I, I, I'm a 69 graduate from high school, it's, it's, it's pitiful. I realize it's time to set my life straight, to repent, because my role model of uh, to be a, a godly man must be responsible and I'm being around a lot of young men and I want to minister to them so I want to know what a man should be like what he's responsible for I want to be part of God's movement God's spirit God touching lives these are my two sons and I'm hoping that they will get an impression that there's hundreds of thousands of men that want to follow God yeah there was no registration for this event we, we had conducted 20 Two stadium NFL stadium events throughout the year leading up to this and at each one of those events we cast vision for it we um, collected an offering to help pay for it it was a nine million dollar event and tuition free so we had no way to calibrate how many men would come we did know but we heard the stories of men in different parts of the country organizing these caravans like semi-truck truckers, I mean, coming together, RVs. So, you know, whole regions of the country from the Midwest, West Coast, wherever, would organize these long caravan um, treks to Washington, D.C. So we knew it was gonna be significant. We planned for a full, fully filled National Mall. But, you know, there's no seating, there's no entrance gates, there's nothing like that, so there was some risk in it for sure. We, we knew we needed video and audio throughout the mall. We set up the stage fairly close to the U.S. Capitol. If you look at an aerial of the mall, it's sort of like a cross, I don't know if you knew that. So you've got the Capitol and Lincoln at one end and then Jefferson and the White House going this way. So we set up near the Capitol and we had men all the way back to Lincoln. And then as far as you could go to Jefferson, and they couldn't go too far towards the White House, but we had 15 Jumbotron screens, portable ones, the big like NFL caliber video screens with, with sound. Chuck Lane and a whole team of the hardware producers did all that. But I do remember in one meeting, the, the issue came up that there's not enough portable Jumbotron screens in the United States. And uh, somebody asked, well, what about Europe? There were more portable Jumbotron screens in Europe, so we had to bring those over on boats. It was the only way we could find that many portable screens. So we did have video and sound for the entire mall. We didn't know if it'd be filled. We found out later some independent agency did an aerial flyover and they did pictures of the full mall and then they could grid out how many men. And when you looked at the men on the actual strip and then all the men under the trees on both sides of the, the green strip, it was where I was at in the producer um, tent out in front of the stage. We couldn't get from there to the stage. It was packed so tight with men chest to chest. So it was just a, uh, we had, but we had no idea. Listen to me men, the story of a nation is the story of its families written large. And if we want to see these things change out here, we've got to start in our home. A messed up man will produce a messed up family that will produce a messed up church that will result in a messed up neighborhood that will cause a messed up city that will bring about a messed up county that will result in a messed up state that will reside in a messed up country that will bring about a messed up world. So if we want better worlds composed of better countries inhabited by better states made up of better counties that are composed of better cities inhabited by better neighborhoods illumined by better churches made up of better families, we better go home better men. It starts with our own commitment to be men of God.
That's where it starts. We're going to reclaim biblical leadership. And biblical leadership knows nothing of forcing women and oppressing women and misusing women. Biblical leadership means when you come home, you come home to your second job. You don't come home to pick up the newspaper. You don't come home to pick up the TV channel surfer. You come home to dry the dishes as she washes them. You come home to help get the kids ready for bed. Then you get on your knees beside the bed, you and your wife, and you dedicate your children to God. Biblical leadership means that your wife is not stifled. She grows and blossoms and flourishes, and she becomes significant because you loved her and supported her and encouraged her and helped her and affirmed her and strengthened her and dedicated her. It means you lay your hands on each one of those children and on that wife and bless them in the name of God. That's spiritual leadership. So I first became involved in Promise Keepers, um, I want to say it was probably the second year that they did stadium events. And then they announced that they were going to have a, a nationwide meeting in Washington, D.C. And I really felt compelled to go to this. I absolutely have a favorite moment in Stand the Gap. It would caught me in, uh, there at the event, and then it was just magnified and re-watching it. I'm going to ask you to reach in your pocket, pull your wallet out, take a picture out right now. I remember at one point they asked us to get down on our knees and, and pull out our wallet. And this was back before the days of cell phones, of course. They said, I want you to pull up the, the picture of your wife and your kids. I want you to look at that picture. Maybe you didn't spend enough time with this person and they're gone out of your home and college. So Isaac Canales asked the men to pull out pictures of their family, wives and kids, and to put those pictures on the grass. Take a step back and I want you to get down as low as you can get before God right now as we confess our sins, asking for mercy. And you know, in our culture, men have been so beaten down and, and devalued. And they really encouraged us to stand up and be that godly leader that God is calling you to be. You're gonna take a little bit of flack here and there, that's okay. You be true to God, honor your wife, love your children, and, and lead your family. And so we, we, you know, here's however many, you know, guys pulling out their pictures of their loved ones and praying for their families and making a personal commitment. We all need to confess before God our sins of abuse against our families, especially our wives, our kids. Get down low. If you can lay down on your face, prostrate, on the grass of this mall, out in the street, in the church where you're at, listening or watching. Get down low before God. If you can't take a picture out, write the name of someone that you have abused on a piece of paper right now, real quick. And I want you to hold that picture or that piece of paper with that name down, written down right there in front of you. And I want you to look at it as a symbol. Cup it in your hand. If you're lying on your face, that's fine. Just take it out and look at that person. Now I want you to pray this prayer with me and mean it with all your heart. Almighty God, I confess that I have been an abusive man as a husband, as a friend, as a father, as a son, as a brother, I have sinned against you, myself, my community, my nation, and my home. I have sacrificed my family on the altar of machismo, selfishness, greed, power, pleasure, and personal ambition. Oh God, I need your help. It was a very moving experience to be there with so many men. I mean, here's guys just humbly confessing their sins, worshiping God, and, and committing to follow the Lord. And that somehow that energy just flowed through everyone where 
As we were all humbling ourselves before God, I think it just inspired corporately the whole group, like, yes, I'm really all in, and I'm going to follow God at any cost. I still run into people today who were on their knees with their face to the grass that day. And we just saw so many stories where, you know, dads and grandpas, their hearts turned profoundly to the Lord that day. And the ripple effect on their spouses and kids and grandkids, I think, lives on today. I felt very empowered with the things that we had been taught and knew that I had some absolute marching orders to go back and just invest in my family and, and in my church. There was, a, there was a softening that wasn't there before. I remember him uh, just reading his Bible every morning at the kitchen table after he had gone to the event. And uh, again, you know, things at home were so toxic and dark and just to consistently see my father like he, you know the the phrase of like um kids catch more than they learn you know than you're trying to teach them it's more caught than taught as i think what they say and he wasn't saying okay it's time for me to read my bible now look everybody i'm, I'm making a godly choice he just was very quiet had this little grapefruit and his Bible, and every morning was over there uh, reading it, and that affected me. And then I remember he got involved with my Sunday school class at church. Um, him and like one other dad became like our meet, uh, the main teachers, and I think uh, probably because the third grade class was crazy, so they needed a little strength in there. But he, all of a sudden, he was just like so much more present where he wasn't before. That we come acknowledging our sins, repenting of every one of them, and giving our hearts to you, God. There is tremendous value of having a godly man in the home. Men gathering together to desire and strive to be more like Jesus is powerful. Men were crying and on their knees and in prayer. The audience were men of various cultures, church denominations, different interests, and social economic statuses. As a mother of six and a grandmother of seven, I have learned through the generations that fathers and mothers are both very important in raising our children. In 1997, so many devoted, dedicated men ready to give their all to come back to God has meant so much. I have heard countless testimonies of generations of these men who after attending Promise Keepers were forever changed and how the seven promises helped guide them back and created a path of responsibility. There is a movement that is sweeping the nation to restore our men to be the husbands and fathers God intended them to be and to stand for righteousness. I think it's something that's often said, your picture of your father is the picture that you have of God growing up. And if you see someone who's consistent, who's firm, who's loving, who's present. In adulthood, how much easier would that be to transfer God is that way? And not to say that if you haven't seen that as an example, you can never see that version of God. Of course you can. He can heal those parts of our minds and our hearts. But the father wound any parent wound, but the father wound can be a very deep, deep thing that I think can affect a person that nothing else can. I know that Promise Keepers had an effect on my father and therefore had an effect on me, and still to this day does.
Richardson, who was Vice President for Communications, uh, gave me the responsibility to select speakers for Promise 6. Uh, a promise keeper is committed to uh, breaking down walls between race and denomination to demonstrate biblical unity in the body of Christ. We had our own men's ministry called the International Christian Brotherhood, and we took 600 men down to the Stand in the Gap event. It was an amazing thing to see 600 men of color, mostly men of color, get off of these buses dressed in black, looking like military, and seeing them march from the buses to the mall where everyone was sitting. And it just so happens that when they got there, as they were approaching, it was an area where a bunch of bikers, predominantly white bikers, were sitting on the grass. And then you see all of these bikers get up and you see this, these two groups facing each other. These men of color dressed in black walking forward and then these bikers stand up and they're looking at them and all of a sudden you see them come together and start hugging each other. It was amazing. I get goosebumps thinking about it. It was amazing. But it really was an image of what Stand in the Gap was all about. It was coming together around that, again, common theme of reconciliation. Back to God, back to our families, back to responsible manhood, and back to one another. It was an amazing, amazing event. I had the privilege of bringing a 12-minute message about racial reconciliation. And it was just an event that God orchestrated incredibly well and it left an indelible mark on us as Christian men, on the Christian community, American society, and around the world. On August 28, 1963, right here in this city of Washington, D.C., more than 200,000 people walked from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial in the most massive protest demonstration this country had ever seen. They came to support pending civil rights legislation, and many came to see and hear the man that would subpoena the conscience of this nation before the judgment seat of morality, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. But only four months prior, on April 16, 1963, this champion against the sickness of racism and discrimination, this Nobel Peace Prize winner, sat in a Birmingham, Alabama jail cell. He was there because he believed, as a Christian, that America was a nation of values and principles born out of a Judeo-Christian heritage, and its citizens had a duty, a responsibility, to hold it accountable to those values and those principles. With only a few notable exceptions, those he thought would be his strongest allies, the Christian church, they became his greatest opponents. Many who were not antagonistic simply substituted caution for courage and remained silent behind the security of stained glass windows. In the midst of glaring injustices perpetrated upon the Negro, he watched as white churchmen stood by speaking hypocritical religious irrelevancies in the middle of a call of God to rid the nation of racial and economic injustice, he heard ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. He watched as many churches committed themselves to a gospel that focused on heaven 
with no relevance to the conditions on earth. A gospel reminiscent of the message taught to African slaves, giving them hope only in death, the life hereafter, but no hope in the life that now is. The very institution that was called to be the moral influence against discrimination was itself a practitioner of racism and discrimination and the most segregated institution in American society. Beautiful churches with their majestic steeples and massive religious education buildings. Over and over, Dr. King found himself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were they when populist politicians sounded the trumpet for defiance and hatred? Where were their voices of support when bruised and wearied Negroes decided to rise up and hold America accountable to its declaration of liberty and justice for all? Where were their voices when glaring injustices were perpetrated not only against the Negro, but against Native Americans? Where were the voices of that church, that institution of moral justice, when injustices were perpetrated against Spanish Americans, Asian Americans, and Jews? Here we are, the Church of Jesus Christ a generation later, and we still have to repent not merely for sins of commission, but for the greater sin of omission, the sin of silence and non-involvement. The words of Jesus Christ ring true today out of the Gospel of Luke. Woe to you religious leaders, because you tithe your possessions and offer up sacrifices, but you have neglected justice and the love of God especially for your brothers. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. My African-American Christian brothers, don't you think for one minute that I stand here putting the totality of blame on the white Christian church? Because I believe that today marks a new beginning, a new day in history that there'll no longer be a white church, a black church, an Asian church, a Spanish church, a Native American church, but we'll go back to Antioch where they were all called Christians at first. In the 1990s and 80s, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I was accustomed to monochromatic silos of a Christian expression which means everyone attended church to a great degree, the vast majority, based on your denominational inclination, your biblical worldview, sometimes your political affiliation, but primarily the color of your skin. All of a sudden in 1997, for the first time ever in my lifetime, I saw white men, African-American, Latino, Asian, Native Americans worshiping Jesus together as one. It was a moment that defined me this idea of the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17, verse 21, make them one as you and I are one, it could actually become a reality. PK empowered me to go beyond my limited myopic cultural worldview and embrace a kingdom culture narrative that is Christ-centered, Bible-based, spirit-empowered, multi-ethnic, and multi-generational. As you've heard, Martin Luther King on this very same mall expressed a dream of oneness that God's children, whether black or white, a Jew or Gentile, Protestant or Catholic, would join hands and say free at last. Well, my brothers, each of us here today who have accepted Jesus Christ and are born again of the Spirit of the living God, we are free for whom the Son has set free. He is free indeed, but we have not joined hands. Have we joined hands and brothers are we one? Brothers, I have a new dream today. 
I dreamed that 400,000 churches in America that call Jesus Lord would join hands in recognition that we have one common adversary and when we come together we are form that which is invincible, the power of one. I have a dream that denominations will keep their doctrine and keep their distinction but drop their dividing walls and come together and join hands to form that which is invincible, the power of one. I got a new dream today, brothers, that each one of you here that call Jesus Lord will move out of your comfort zone. You'll reach out and make a committed relationship with a brother who is racially different. And when we do that, uh, then we can come together and we can form that which is invincible, the power of one. Standing the Gap is unique. It's not just another event. One, because it fulfills Exodus 34, verses 23 and 24, when God called all the men of Israel, and he told all the men of Israel to come meet with him three times a year. And he said, if you will come meet with me three times a year, I'll save your nation. Wow, that's why it's unique. Because God says, if I can get the men, I can save the nation. Do you know how powerful that is? The challenges for men today, well, they're great. Uh, they are overwhelming. Because of all that is in the culture, now we don't have to just fight our own challenges of the flesh. We've got to fight a culture that wants to make it convenient to give up our manhood. Whether it's maintaining our sexuality and keeping it under the control of the Holy Spirit, or whether it's being loyal to our families and not abandoning our marriage or the responsibility to lead in the raising of our children, whether it's being willing to be public about our faith and not try to hide in church and uh, not take responsibility for our spiritual development and the spiritual development of our loved ones, and not being willing to let the culture know that you don't, you, you march out of step because you're listening to a different drum beat and to be be a full-time Christian and not a part-time saint. These are the challenges that men face today. And only as men are growing in their faith and being supported and held accountable by other men can we maintain the standard high, grow to such a point where we are making a difference in the lives of other men so that other males around us, our contemporaries and the next generation of boys becoming men, knows what manhood looks like because they're not only hearing it, they're seeing it modeled right in front of their eyes. Promise Keepers is desperately needed to remind men of this foundational responsibility because we know in a house, when the foundation gets shaky, the rest of the house is in trouble. When men get shaky, the things that are dependent upon them are, are gonna be uh, challenged in a unique way. So Promise Keepers today is needed to be that reminder and to support the church as the ongoing facilitator of biblical manhood. Not just maleness, because you can be a male and not a man in the kingdom. A man in the kingdom is responsible under God. Promise keepers need to keep that in our ear, in our psyche, in our thinking, in our framework, in our mindset, so that we never stray away from operating as kingdom men. We need that reminder. We need that catalyst. And we need that fulfillment, that uh, ministry that challenges us to make this a lifestyle and not just event. Because after all, men have been called to stand in the gap. Do you love the Lord? Would you say, I love you, Lord? I love you, Lord. It was absolutely nonstop glory. This is what God wants men to set the example of being. 
a family in supernatural unity with all of our diversity and our distinctives and our giftedness and even our difference and even disagreement. We do not have to divorce and separate one another as believers. These men came together in this supernatural love, this unconditional love. It was Christ's life, Christ's love. And it was Christ's likeness that was revealed in their countenance. You could just see it all day long. There was an energy that was electric and it went to the farthest outreach of the crowd and they stayed right to the very end. I know I was the last spokesman and we didn't leave until we dismissed. God was there. The men came seeking God's will done on earth through his family. And men were understanding that they needed to be examples as leaders, totally committed to God, to his word, to his will, to demonstrating his love beginning at home with their wife, not lording over their wife, but loving their wife like Christ loved the church, not exasperating their children, but being an example to the children, being an inspiration to the whole family, an inspiration to the community. And that is precisely what I witnessed. Lives were changed. I'm telling you, it was the most amazing thing well, that's what we should want today. It's what we desperately need. It's what marriages need. It's what every family needs, every child needs, every neighbor needs, every employer and employee needs. This is the way we ought to be with one another, men being examples and leaders. Well, let's pray that a move of God that moved over a million men to the mall seeking to be one with Christ and with one another that we can inspire another movement of God on and through men for his kingdom purpose. I'm glad that we have an opportunity to come together around virtual events and events where men are called together. Let's just pray that God will use us as men to inspire the next great awakening, which our world so desperately needs. And I think the stage is set for it. I think there's an Americana version of what a hero is. It's Clint Eastwood, it's John Wayne. It's the man who's all alone, who has no friends, who has no vulnerabilities, and he's just a pillar of strength that everybody looks at, and he goes and kills the bad guys, and all these people try to keep him from killing the bad guys because they're all cowards, but he knows. And uh, you know, what's the Bible's definition of a man? It's King David. What's King David doing? He's dancing uncontrollably, where his wife's like, geez, now calm down. He's crying uncontrollably. He's writing songs and playing instruments. He's the most ultimate vulnerable man before God, before people, but then he's also a man. Nobody messes with those whom he's in charge of, and I think both are true. So for me, I had to go from the LAPD, Clint Eastwood way of seeing things to, wow, if I break down and cry, my kids aren't going to look down on me, actually. Um, they're going to see a man who is vulnerable before the Lord and before them. What is the 2020s version of 1990s Promise Keepers? And there's some similarities, and then there's some significant differences, which is basically the, the ability for us to use technology, virtual events, and have an outstanding app. So the great thing about Stand on the Gap was you saw all these dads with their kids on their shoulders. You saw intergenerations we saw there was one group that was five generations of men all at Santa the Gap at the same time what an incredible blessing well we now have the technology we didn't have then to be able to do a follow-up so how can older men teach the younger men if we would have been able to do this at Santa the Gap we would have we now have the technology download the app go through this 21 day Bible study we're going to join with men all over the world to do a Bible study, all of us together, on how do we pass the torch, older men to the younger men. We have guys who were at that event when they were 15 years old, now they're 40. Now they wanna know, how can I take what I learn and give it to the younger people? We now have that ability, so download the app and join us for this 21 day challenge. And I felt like it was just God and I out there in that whole big crowd. You know, because as, as, as bad as I would hate to admit it, some of those prejudices I had, I don't look at him the same now. It came down to each of us as men making decisions in our own life 
to uh, rededicate ourselves to the cause of Christ. I was able to repent for a lot of things I had done wrong, you know, and that one was um, the things I'd done to my wife, you know, the abuse. I realized that in my heart, I had to let that go. My kids are seven, five, three, and and eleven months. And uh, the three-year-old may not understand, but I think the five and seven-year-old will when I, you know, ask for their forgiveness um, and tell them that things are going to change. Standing in the gap challenges me to come back and to start the process of letting go of some of the things that have been nagging me and, and persecuting me for the last several years. I never thought that I'd live long enough to see a day like we saw today. It's a wonderful feeling to finally be free.